All right, so welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, thanks for joining me. And I'm John, the Simcoe County Museum. Um, really excited for today's speaker for our uh, National Indigenous History Month uh, virtual series that we're doing. Um, this afternoon we have Sean Corvier. Um, super excited to have Sean here talking to us today. Um, he's, uh, you know, worked for Parks Canada for many, many years uh, doing Indigenous interpretation. He's a knowledge keeper, has a lot of um, knowledge about lots of different practices that he can share with us today. He's going to talk about uh, flint napping, which is kind of an ancient, um, really interesting uh, uh, technique. Um, so super excited to have you here, Sean. Thanks for joining us and uh, take it away. All right, foot napping. It's not foot mapping. You know, every time I uh, I tell people to ask me what I'm doing, I always say I'm uh, I'm foot napping, and then they always retort back saying foot mapping. I never heard of foot mapping before, but uh, all the power to you, I guess. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick little introduction to myself uh, and for you folks as well. Again, uh, welcome to um, we're in the middle of uh, Indigenous uh, Awareness Month or Cultural Awareness Month. Uh, whatever you may call it. Um, yeah. So, Ani Bojo, Ajijak Dorum, Chiking Donjba, Sean Dishtakosh, Ojibwe Indau, Gawi Mikwisi. So, what I said is uh, my name is Sean. Uh, my beautiful community is in Chiging on Manitoulin Island, uh, and it means a village amongst the steep rocks. Uh, my language is Ojibwe, and my spirit name is um, One That Leaves No Tracks. And the reason for that is um, I do a lot of do a lot of outreach. Plus, I do a lot of a little bit of consulting on the side. So when I'm out doing my, uh, well, let's say I'm doing an Indigenous plants talk, and um, I'm not actually going into the forest. I'm not leaving any tracks. I'm doing it through virtual, through through multimedia here. So that's so leaving no tracks, if that makes sense to everybody. Just kind of cool. Um, all right. So the art of flint napping is the um, the production of stone tools or manufacturing of stone tools using using antler or or wood uh you know i'm going to need a couple of hammer stones here as well i got a small i got a medium hammer stone here and i got a big hammer stone here to do the quality work that i need on the big nodules that we get and again this is just the antler and this is what was used so you can find these droppings um in the forest if you go walking around you might find some uh, modern day foot nappers actually use copper now. So I got some copper. This is a copper bopper here, uh, me, uh, heavy grade. I got a medium sized copper bopper. And then I got a shaper here, copper bopper. So these is what take take that place instead of copper. I got a bigger bopper here. Uh, but these antler tins are really really neat because these actually these actually come off come off the antler here. So I just cut them off and I round them off. Uh, just on the ground, and they're great for for shaping, but are also great for pressure flaking. And we'll talk about pressure flaking. It's towards the end. Pressure flaking is really uh, when you're finishing your piece. So this one here, I was working on the other day. It's not quite finished, but it, we're getting there. It's a nice medium sized point. Uh, it's got that teardrop shape. I'm trying to get it to the right thinness as well. Uh, thinness is important. Maybe six to six millimeters, so I can haft it onto my shaft um, to make a a big shaft or or a spear or an arrow so really cool antlers why antler copper um because uh, antler is hard but it's soft enough for me to grab the stone just like copper if you hit it hard enough it'll dent so same thing uh, copper is soft but hard enough for me to grab the stone if i was using high carbon steel for example uh, as a bopper i bust my work it's too hard so copper is a bit modern day, but I'm getting used to the uh, to the atlas, which is pretty neat, and it's more traditional, of course. So let's a little bit about the tools. Um, how about we talk a little bit about the stone because the stone is really important uh, in order to flatten out. Here I got a big chunk of quartz. Quartz is nappable, but it's not just it's not a um, highest quality as obsidian or chertz or flints, but quartz is uh, really hard to flint nap. And I have a really interesting artifact that I'm going to show you made out of quartz shortly. So quartz, really cool stuff. 
Um, I got some obsidian uh, for you that are Minecrafters out there. Yeah. yeah. Here's a nice big chunk of obsidian. Comes from Oregon. Uh, we have no obsidian in Ontario, but we do have some uh, out west, uh, Alberta. Uh, and nor is any any artifacts, as far as arrowheads or projectile points, have been found in Ontario with obsidian. It's always been chert or flint, that type of a silicate. Okay. So obsidian, yeah. Really, really cool stuff. I've been working now with some man-made glass. And this stuff comes from Perry Sound. Really cool stuff. It's homogenous. You know, I can see through it. Uh, it's highly predictable how it's going to break. Um, it's really, really, really um, high quality stuff. So the gentleman who makes it up there uh, in Paris, uh, but anyways, uh, if you walk out to the big water here in Georgian Bay, um, the water is really turquoise. It's really, really beautiful up there, and that's what it reminds people of. It's a really cool piece. It's a man-made glass. This is what we were after here in Ontario, chert, C-H-E-R-T. This is called Onondaga chert. Found in Lake Erie, maybe the southern end of Lake Ontario, down in Toronto, down that way. So really, really cool stuff. And it's got a really cool trait to it as well. So I got some Keel Cook chert here. Very beautiful blank that I was working on earlier that I spalled off. I'd like to introduce you to these little things if you haven't known them already. The flint and steel, you know, they came here in the 1600s. The French brought them over. And then the British brought them over as well. And the, uh, you know, when they're handing out their, their treaty annuity monies or their presents for the year, uh, I know here in Georgian Bay, there's an island called President Island. And uh, this is where the government would come and meet all the First Nations and they were handing out, uh, you know, flour, potatoes, these as well. So all this is is uh, high carbon steel, and it, what it does is make a beautiful spark. And of course, this was accompanied it some beautiful char cloth. And I've always to rip it, find the sharp edge. Great way of starting fires. Now, if I'm really good, I'll use one strike. Two, stop bad. It takes a little practice, but once you get the hang of it, it's a lot of fun. And you throw it to your nest or your or your tinder, right? But in all honesty, this is sacred, this stuff, the chert and the silicates. So I'm going to put this out. Char cloth, we're 100% uh, uh, environmentally friendly, so I use cotton. People use dryer lint, but they're full of plastics and, you know, even when you burn it. The cotton, on the other hand, it's got natural resins. It's a lot of fun. It's a great project for the family. Um, these are actually hard to come by unless you know a blacksmith, of course. This one's sort of broke. It's called Double Monkey Tail. Uh, the other monkey tail broke off. But my friend, uh, Lloyd Johnston, uh, if you guys know who Lloyd is, he's one of the best blacksmiths in Ontario that I'm aware of. Uh, if you've ever been to the Paul Brent buildings uh, in Ottawa, that little iron fence, him and his crew handmade that a long time ago. So hats off to him, and he's still doing the, the blacksmithing as well. But nice stuff, and it's made out of a file, like a file file, high carbon steel. The science is, is every time I strike it on the silicate, there's a piece of steel that comes off and it ends up on the chart block. So that's really neat. We got some silicates. We got some, uh, we showed you a little bit of some striker stuff, flint and steel, of course, dating back to uh, long ago. Um, how about artifact time? Let's show you an artifact. But before I do, let's do this. I want to introduce you to uh, to Georgian Bay, picture style. I don't know how well everybody can see it. I'm going to see if I can get a little closer here. <clears throat> so this is the map of Georgian Bay, everybody. And Georgian Bay is on what body of water? It's on Lake Huron, right? We have five great lakes in the region, of course. Georgian Bay itself? 15,000 square kilometers. It's huge. We're next to the Canadian Shield, which is 8 million square kilometers. Uh, if some of us have been to the Colorado River, the bottom of the river there is green. 
I live in a beautiful town of Wabashin just over here. And Wabashin is a First Nation word, and it means where the rock meets the water or the water meets the rock. You're going to see two different land masses here. So this is where the St. Lawrence Lowland region meets the Canadian Shield. And it cuts halfway through this island. Traditionally, that island was called Paul Mendenagog Island, but our Ojibwe folks. And what it meant was an island to appear, uh, appear floating in a huge river. And actually, if you're coming in from the west, it does actually look like a huge river. Our Wendat peoples actually have a very similar name to the island. Um, but we in Bosley Island now, uh, which is a contemporary recreational name, but it's really, really steeped in history, this, this island. We know over, over 5,000 years ago that stone tool manufacturing was going on right about here. So they were making arrowheads and end scrapers on the island. Even 5,000 years ago, I can walk from here to mainland. Water levels were a lot different back then as well. If you guys remember where the Bruce is, the Alapini Amelie Ridge, that's where the falls used to be. If you look at the map, you'll see Manitoulin and then Bruce. Highway 6 also goes across the bay there, uh, Wyerton area. So underwater, underwater archaeology, uh, they're finding arrowheads, they're finding hunting blinds. Uh, even the Adelaide or Apaginatig, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. So it knows that we know that our ancestors ran caribou through there, through that ridge, the Alapena Emmer Ridge. So really neat. Uh, so this is where the archaeological dig, dig happens, and we'll leave it at there for that. Okay, so really cool. Georgian Bay. Georgian Bay used to be called Matchadash Bay before it was called Georgian Bay. Matchadash Bay is right, right over here. And it means, uh, the word's been anglicized a little bit, but it means um, like a, a layer of a beast, where the beast's layer would be. But back in the old maps, because George Bay was named after King George III, I believe, and then uh, Machadash Bay stretched from there all the way to Manitoulin Island, if you look at the old maps. So there you go, Machadash, before it became George Bay. There's a little bit of history there. Yeah, it's really cool. Who knew the Canadian Shield? Eight million square kilometers. Okay. Am I muted again here? Can you hear me? I can see you, Uncle Sean. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. I had a little glitch there. Yeah. All right. So I wanted to show you artifact. I just wanted to touch a little bit on the island because, like I said, I know in, George, in Georgian Bay that still to manufacture is going on on the island out there. And we also know at least 12 different cultures utilized the island long ago as well. So here's an artifact that's made out of quartz. It's huge. You can see these little percussion marks here. One, two there, one there, one there. And he was probably using a nice big antler, like just like that. You can see they almost, they almost sort of fit that percussion mark there. So this is made out of quartz, yeah. Whoever made this long ago uh, had to be well-skilled, so we figured somebody with an, uh, an elder or somebody uh, with stature. Um, we also know that the blade was never used because where it was found, it was found underwater uh, at the Camp Kitchy site on the island, actually. The chef was getting out of the water, and he put his foot in the sand and sliced his foot open, and he reached underwater in the sand, and this is what he pulled out. So remember what I mentioned earlier about 5,000 years ago? We can walk from there to mainland. A lot of stuff is actually buried underwater. It's a really cool big blade there. I brought one more. This one's over 5,000 years old. Um, this is a fishing projectile point because you can see the other one broke off, the little prong here. Uh, but for fishing, yeah. It's a really, really cool, huh? And it's big. You think this would have been on the bow and arrow? No, it's too big, it's too bulky, not aerodynamic. But I do have a tool here that they would have used this for. Let me look in the tickle trunk. Let's see what I got here. Uh, well, here's an arrow that I was working on. Very beautiful. It's called a Cherokee tie or a Cherokee wrap. Looks like I got four, four feathers, but I actually only got two on there. It's really cool. It flies really good, actually. And this is a four-foot arrow. This is what they would have looked like long ago as well. Just, just like that, not like the modern day arrows that we got. 
Aha, here's what we got. This little stick here. Says I had carved these, by the way, because you just can't buy them anywhere. So all of this stuff you guys see here today is that I, I made it, except for the copper boppers, of course. Um, I guess I can make those too. All right, getting back to this tool, it's really cool. Some of us might have seen this on already. So I'm going to show you the end of this stick. In the history books, it's called an atlatl, which means whip in a war by the Aztecs. You're going to see that little spur there. See that spur? And there's a saddle at the end of this eagle head. So I put an eagle head on there just to give it a nice little lead. look to it. Uh, you see my little saddle. There's a little groove in there. And this tool is actually only about my arm length. It wouldn't have been any longer than that. But I know that Simcoe County Museum has a Macedon skull over there. But the story is back in uh, back in the day in Springwater Township, there was a construction company that was digging. I don't know, it was 10 to 15 feet underground. And they came across a Macedon tusk. Unreal, eh? So I got to see it. It was really cool. Uh, it was all wrapped in silicate. So because uh, if it would have just uh, evaporated, it would have just turned to powder. Uh, but really, really cool. But this tool and that animal go hand in hand. And some of the arrowheads that were produced on the island, maybe, would have been, maybe could have been used for shooting and killing those animals back then. So the atlatl is a, this tool was, it was used as a group effort. That's why it predates the bow and arrow. It's older than the bow and arrow. And the reason why we don't find them in Ontario is because they're really biodegradable, right? Absolutely. But the evidence that left behind are these really beautiful arrowheads or projectile points that you find in farmer's fields, you see them in museums. There's a lot of them, uh, you know, even when I first saw an arrowhead, a big one, I said, wow, geez, that must have been a big bow and arrow that it must have been on. But as I learned the yard mapping and how, how it intricately um, works with everything else, with our natural and our cultural history, you know, in all honesty, if it wasn't for flint napping, we wouldn't be here, to be honest with you. And I'm gonna tell a little story about that later on. So this tool is called Nyla. For us, it's called Apa Ginatig. A tallowin, which means he throws the arrow with the stick. I'd hold it in my, I'd hold it like this and I'd chuck it, but hang on to the stick. So the, in my arrow, there's a beautiful little knock in there. And then this fits in that little groove. This sits on the saddle. Now gravity will actually keep it in there as long as I got it on an angle like this. And you can see how, it's, how I'm holding it. But if I had a six to eight foot arrow, up to 200 kilometers an hour and two football fields, Nowadays, I just use a 32-inch carbon arrow that you can buy at the local, the local bow and arrow shop, archery shop. I can throw that 100 yards using the stick. That's far. So for woolly mammoths, mastodon, woodland caribou, woodland bison, all those big game animals. And like I said, we've been six to eight feet, not a four-foot arrow, right? So really, really cool. Uh, the atlato uh, is part of the no auto language from the Aztecs, and it means weapon of war. This was the only tool that could actually penetrate their armor uh, when they came by and the first time. And of course, the Spanish came back and decimated them later. Uh, but again, found all over the world. Uh, caves in France, uh, here they find them in the Canadian Arctic because the ice is a great preservative. And they're finding them in caribou dung, which is the poo. So this means uh, uh, when the caribou were inundated by black flies and mosquitoes, they get onto these big sheets of ice to digest their food and get away from the bugs. And this is when they were actually ambushed. So that's why they're finding the big shafts. They're actually finding the, the tool in the ice as well, maybe broken projectile points, full points as well. It's really, really neat. Uh, some of our Inuit today actually still have a very similar tool that they use for, for harpooning uh, their animals as well. So it's still really, really neat. And again, we just don't find them because they're biodegradable here in Ontario. Uh, I know they don't share too much of this in the history books here in Ontario, but hopefully that history and that culture uh, um, uh, we're moving forward reconciliation and bringing these this this ancient history back you know and it's part of everybody's culture here so we're all we're all in Canada here so we're really cool all right so the atlanta some of the australians use it. it's called the woomera one last story i'll show i'll share you with the with that tools that um when christopher columbus when he sort of uh, he got lost and he came to this side of the world uh called turtle island or we know it now as north america of course he was quickly reminded how deadly the Atlanta was because when they landed here, some of the First Nation guys killed a few of his guys. But you got to remember the Spanish had percussion cap guns, so they had to put the wad, the pellet, and the powder in. You know, I would have had five days shots off of this before they loaded their gun. 
but he was astonished that they were using him on this side of the planet because when Christopher Columbus, when he went around the world and he stopped at all these different places and ran into indigenous or First Nations people, they're actually using a very similar tool. So it's really, really cool. Um, it's one of my favorite, and they're fun to throw. So if we were here today and, and we we're doing this live, we'd probably be outside throwing it and showing you how to how to how to whip it. I like to see them in the Olympics, actually. Instead of the compound balls, go on a big six at the fire. It's really cool. All right. How's that so far? So far, so good. Everybody okay? Everybody need a bio break? We're good. All right. So let's get into the traits of the stone. Now, the traits of the stone is really unique. Without this trait to the stone or the glass or the silicate itself, uh, you can't flit now. Uh, you know, the science is really neat. So if you threw a rock into the water, uh, you see the ripples go like this. Um, the same thing happens when I send energy into the stone. It just happens so fast that our eyes can't pick it up. But there's subtle little wee traits. You'll see little ripples. So it's just like the water. They freeze inside the stone after I send the energy through. Um, it's, it's really neat. Really neat. Um, and I still don't know how our ancestors knew this, this part of it, the science of it. Maybe they didn't call it science. It was just the nature of the stone, how it broke to them. Science probably wasn't a word back then, of course. But they had to know some scientists. So this is some science from it. So this is what I mean by when I say First Nations people are, are the first scientists to this land because we had to, we had to learn how to flint nap. We had to learn what medicines to eat, uh, what not to eat by watching other animals by having dreams, you know, like trade. You know, the to me, archaeologists are just realizing how big the trade route right, was here in, in North America. And, and uh, I think within the next 10, 15 years, we're going to be seeing even more um, as, as we encroach on, on these lands that haven't been used through development and that sort of thing. Uh, so really, really neat. Not that part, but as far as finding some, some tools. The trade is really cool. So if I can show you, let's uh, take this obsidian, for example. I'm going to shine the light on it here. See this uh, conchoidal looking, shell shaped looking stuff here? I don't know how, maybe there you can see it. All the church, the flints, all the glass, the obsidian have this trait because no matter which way you hit it, it's always going to break that way. So that's why they used it because of this trait into it. It's really, really cool. Same with the glass, have that as well. So today, Maybe I will, uh, maybe I'll smash off a piece of obsidian today. We'll see what happens. Um, some other things you're going to need as well. I just got to grab my um, some protection. So I got some moose hide. I got my little bin. So this is for on my thigh here, because this is how it's going to go. I got all my moose hide here, and I'm going to be I'm going to be spalling a piece off here, uh, what we call a nodule. We know back on the island here on this map, there was no church in Georgian, Georgian Bay, so they had to go 100, maybe 150 kilometers to get it and bring it back to at Mendenogog Island back in the day, or mostly island. And, uh, you know, bridge park canoes, you know, if people know Georgian Bay, it gets pretty rough up there. And the nodules are probably about this size. Maybe, maybe this size if you're lucky. If you're driving down the, um, the Don Valley Parkway, if you look along the side in the ditch, along the rocks, you're gonna see layers because the church, is found in sedimentary layer. Uh, it's in limestone. Uh, flint is found in usually sedimentary chalk. And the process is time and pressure that makes it. There's little creatures in here too. I can't show you, but there's little wee fossils in the in here as well. So time and pressure makes this. So I got my got my pad here for my thigh. The other thing you're going to need, and I can't forget, uh, you know, I can't uh, stress this enough. You're going to need some of these guys. Ta-da! Band-Aids, yes. Who knew, eh? Uh, I'll give you a caution. If I'm going to be doing this today, it's a chance. I wouldn't say a good chance, but there's a chance that I might cut myself. Don't be alarmed. I got Band-Aids here. You know, when I first started flip-napping, I cut my hands all the time. 
Uh, but after a while, you get used to it. You get used to how to, you get to respect the stone. Even, yeah, it's the best word I can say. You, you get to respect it more. You know how to touch it. Back then, we didn't have gloves, of course, or anything like that. Uh, so you need your band-aids. I got, this is for my pressure flaking uh, at the end of it. So this is a thumb guard. This goes into my thumb. And I got a big pad in there because when I'm going to finish off my product, I'm going to stick my work in here and I'm going to push as hard as I can along this little ridge. And because if I was to slip, I would slip and hit my palm. But it would have been a big, could have been a piece of wood back then, maybe some more great big leather pieces as well. Um, yeah. What else? Oh, yeah, here, hammer stones. Again, I got that big one. Um, so let's see if we can take a chunk off then. How does that work? Um, oh, this one here, I wanted to show you this little guy. This is called the Nushi stick. And you can see I got a little copper point there. So it's a pressure flaker, and I can use this two ways. One way, it just gives me extra leverage and more power to, to pressure flake. So I can hold it in here. I can have my work in my palm of my hand. I can do it this way. Or once I get good enough, I practice this already, I can put a piece of my hand and I use my legs to, to, to pose them like that, to snip off pieces. That makes sense. But traditionally, there would have been a big bone there as well. So it would have probably been this. I forget the name of this little part of the antler. Uh, it escapes me, but this little part would have been perfect for, for an issue stick. Yeah, so there we go. Okay. Jeez, you guys are making me nervous. Just sweating over here. Just kidding. Okay, I got this. I got that. Now, this is going to come back to the science part again. Anything under 90 degrees, uh, this way, I can I can spall off a piece. Okay, so that's that's that, that's key. So anything under 90 degrees, like that. If it was like this, I wouldn't be able to smash a piece off. Right? Makes sense. So anything under 90 degrees, I can take a piece off. Energy always falls a ridge when you're flint napping. Um. Yeah. So the harder I push, as I got my skin on there. The harder I push that ridge into my thigh, the further the energy goes down that ridge. And I'm going to show you a ridge here. See that? See this ridge right here? There's one there. Uh, there's a little fine one there. There's another ridge here. Ridge there. There's a ridge there. But today, I think I'm just going to go after this ridge. There's a what we call a step fracture right here. It's just there's some impurities in the in the uh, silicate. So if I send energy in there, it's just going to bust out there. If that makes sense. But anyways, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a make an effort to get a piece off here anyway. So there's that ridge I'm after. Okay, can you guys see that ridge right there? So energy always follows the ridge. Now the truth starts. Here we go. This is napping. Don't get caught napping at work, they say. The first thing I got to do is I got to make a platform. Because if I showed you under a microscope, along the edges here, these little fine edges here, there's little imperfections in there. If I was to send energy in there, what will happen? My energy will get dispersed in different directions, and then it won't work. By rubbing it, though, by rubbing it, I'm gonna make it all one solid piece, if that makes sense. So I got my little grinding stone here. I'm off, I'm after that little ridge. So all I do is just give it a nice rub. You won't see this, but there's a little bit of dust coming off here. Since it's a silicate, it's silicate dust. Back in England, when they were making gun flints for their gun uh, percussion cap guns, there was uh, 30 guys probably in a room. I have a really small house. Maybe about as big as this room. 30 guys in there. It would be a couple of wheels, some guys snapping off the chair, the flint, and one guy grinding it, and it's releasing all this dust. There's no ventilation. The men didn't pit, uh, live past 30 because uh, they got silicosis of the lungs. So if you're doing this um, and you're doing it day in, day out, I don't do it day in, day out, um, be doing it outside, have a fan, 
if you're if you have a garage or something, but do it outside if you can uh, to save yourself. But uh, like I said, I don't I don't do it every day, hours in and out. So, but still, you want to be on the safe side. Okay, so wear a mask or, or a fan or do it outside. All right, so I'm going to do this platform again, but this time I'm going to use this. Good old Value Village. Yeah, you go shopping in there. I got a nice grinding stone here. It does the trick, even a little bit more better than the stone. So let's do that one. Again, I'm making a nice strong platform here. I'm rubbing it, taking all the imperfections off. I want it to be all one solid piece. Okay, it doesn't take much. Okay, now here's the, here's the tough part. I'm going to see if I can take a piece off. Okay. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to take that ridge. I'm going to put it on my thigh. I want to support that ridge. Because remember, energy always follows the ridge. Always. Okay. So I'm going to hold it like this. I got it supported. A little bit of protection for myself. So now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to push really hard on my thigh. And I'm going to take my bigger hammer stone, and this should do the trick, this big guy. Um, would that be good enough? Yeah, probably not. Eh? Oh, definitely not. So you remember your small, bigger, large for your for your nodules. All right, I got my big hammer stone here. This should do it. If I do this right, um, I shouldn't have to go, I shouldn't have to grab it and go. <laughs> I can just do a little tap. As long as I got the pressure, and I got that good ridge, it shouldn't take much. So here we go. This is the first step. The first step is coring it. Go and get go to the quarry. Get your nodules. Bring them back. Make sure it's good quality chert. Uh, just a letter, other little thing about the protocol. As I said earlier, the cherts and the flints were sacred to our people. And uh, my protocols, after I'm done all my uh, dibbage or my garbage, I have to go repatriate it back to Mother Earth. So I don't I don't waste it, so I'll, I'll pick it back up and I'll put it in my in my bin. Uh, foot napping also shows the evolution of, of the human brain. And the reason being is that, you know, when we're Neanderthal or no matter what you believe in your um, evolution um, of man itself, but uh, yeah. But all, all, all people had a hand in, in foot napping. Europeans done it to about 4,000 years ago. Uh, which was the height of the Bronze Age in Europe, and then after that, they didn't do it anymore. Uh, just here in North America, we just kept on doing it. And, um, yeah, so that's the only difference. But it's done all, all around the world. All right, so here we go. I'm going to take this ridge. A little, little, little more support here. Okay, so I got the ridge. I'm going to push. I'm going to give this a little tap. I'm nearsighted, so i got to see what I'm doing here. Okay, so here we go. I got a nice little piece off. So I gotta I can make a beautiful little bird point out of that, right? So it fits on there like that. Remember, energy always follows the ridge. I hit it, it followed that ridge. But I did notice there's some imperfections in the in the in the, the obsidian itself. So it wasn't a big piece that I got off, but you got the gist of it. Like I said, you get your piece, do your platform, and then you hit it on the on that 90 degree angle that way, and then I spalled off a piece. Okay, so that's the piece I got off. Make a nice little bird point. I just want to empty this into my. Well, I am going to shape it now. So what do I mean by that is I am going to, you see that it's a little bit crooked, but yet still pretty pretty sharp. You know, sometimes people would have left it the way it is as well, uh, the shirts, because it was sharp. It would be great for skinning or all that kind of a stuff, all that kind of work. Okay. I'm going to use an antler today. So this 10. Okay. I'm going to do some freehand for you guys. 
you could do it this way too. This is the way I first learned. Uh, for me, I learned about four years ago already. Um, it takes about five or six to 12 years to become a master. I'm only on my fourth year, but uh, I'm slowly getting there. And um, yeah, I took the course. It was uh, just outside of Sudbury. I was the only one there. And uh, it was two day course. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And I learned quite a bit because being on one on one is the best way to learn. And, you know, it's First Nations people. We're visual learners. We're hands on people. So I took it uh, very well. And, uh, you know, by the end of the two days, I already had a little, little arrowhead that was, was kind of part of my language, but half assed kind of a deal. But I got a little bit better at it. All right. So I got my piece. Now, the first thing I got to do too is, well, platforming is key, no matter how small your arrowhead is or how you do it. I always have a, I always make a platform. So I'm going to rub this because you want it to grab, right? When you're working it. So you're just going to get. Now I'm going to do some free hands. So what I'm going to do is I'm looking at this. My arrowhead's going to go this way. And the other thing that I got to keep in mind is that my center line that runs, runs the center line. I have a imaginary one in my head, so I got to work above or below that, because if I don't, it'll be crooked. So if I look at this one, sort of got the uh, curvature to it. So I'm going to look, and I'm going to take off this little piece here, right at the edge. So let's give it a little rub. Now I'm going to, so what you want to do is, you just want to, and you're going to see what happened there is that nice, beautiful little percussion flake came off. See a little percussion flake I hit right at the edge, but I'm also thinning it, right? And I'm I'm trying to get that curve out of there. So I'm hitting it from this angle, that which will bring my center line back up. So I got so I'm working it above and below. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a little weird. So I'm gonna do a few more here. I'm gonna stay on this side because I'm trying to thin it out. So I'm gonna do another one here. As I'm working it, you can see that it's sort of starting to shape into a little arrowhead already, right? And I got those beautiful percussion flakes that I hit on the side, and hopefully I'm going to keep it straight. So my next one's going to be right at the edge. So I want to make a nice, strong, I want to make another platform. Now, this part, too, when you're making your platform, I can strategically rub it extra hard in this one spot to strategically send my energy strictly on that on that um, on that ridge even though it's small no matter how big your ridge is remember energy always follows a ridge no matter how small it is so I, I brace it and see if I can get it off here and the other thing I'm doing while I'm doing hand percussion is that I'm taking my finger and I'm putting pressure along that ridge on this one as well because it'll follow it right so let's do this one and I made a nice, beautiful flick. Comes off. And look, it's already starting to look straight. I got to do a few more. But you know, it'll probably take me a good hour to, to finish this off. But I'm going to do another one here. I'll see what I can do in a few minutes here. Yeah, you know what? It's a lot of fun foot napping. If you got, if I don't know if you guys pick blueberries or uh, whatever you do, or if you paint even, it just it's it's just a relief of stress. You know, everything everything is uh, you're just strictly concentrating on this, nothing else, nothing else. So let's do a few more. I know it's hard to see what I'm really doing actually, but. Again, all I'm doing is taking these little ridges, feeling with my hand, and I want to be strategic. I'm going to, oh, okay, so let's do this. Napping, too, is part of, the, part of that noise it makes, too, while I'm doing this, or part of when I'm, when I'm doing the uh, spalling off the big pieces. I'm going to try to put a little point here. At least a small one. See how I'm working it? See how it's starting to short a shape in there? 
that was over 90 degrees, so that's why that didn't go. So I want to make a rub. I got to start off a new one on a, a new platform. Uh, I just broke it. You can see the little perfection in there, <laughs> but that's okay. You got the logistics of it. I'd keep going around till I got a beautiful point, sort of like this. Okay, so this is this is what you're looking for after your your sort of your finished product. That's not quite finished because of what I'm going to do. Now that I got my shape, I got the sort of the right thinness for it, and then I'm going to make a nice strong platform again all the way around. And this is also the fun part because I'm going to pressure flake it now. I want a nice strong platform. Pressure flaking is probably one of the one of my favorites besides falling and, and shaping it myself. Uh, I got to resort to my beautiful thumb guard. They're going to have an extra layer on there. Just pardon me for a second here. Be happy when I get that. Air, I'd have the air conditioning on, but um, you wouldn't hear me, I guess. Okay. Again, uh, safety. So I'm going to put my pad in my hand. I got my extra, extra one on top. This time. This time I'm going to try to show you up close what's going to happen here. You just remember, this is the fun part. I made a platform along the edge. I got uh, my shape. I'm going to put my work in my hand like this. So as you can see, my work. And I platform this edge really hard, OK? So now I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my this is a copper pressure flake here. We're going to do, I'll do one with copper. I'll do one with the bone. So I'm going to take this. Now I'm going to push as hard as I can along that edge that I platform like hard, hard because I, the harder I push, uh, once I get really good, I want to be able to make see this. I don't know how well you see this one, but there's a pressure flake right here. Okay, see these little see the little scars there. Once I get really good, I'm gonna I'll be able to press it almost all the way across. If that makes sense. Yeah. I'm not there yet. It's gonna take me a little while yet. Anyways, so I'm gonna take that edge and then I'm gonna make some pressure flakes. So let's go. You hear that clipping noise? And look, I made a beautiful pressure flake there. I'm gonna do another one. Right along the edge here. I know it doesn't look like I'm pushing anymore because I've gotten so much good at it. But yeah, I'm pushing as hard as I can as I as I go along. And you can see that I made these beautiful pressure flakes with the copper. Right, right along that edge there. And you can see that it's starting to give me a little sharp edge, a little bit of a like a saw edge. All right. So let's do one with the antler. Same thing. I'm gonna go in here. I'm gonna press really hard on my finger, push hard. And I find with the bone, it's a lot, or with the antler, it's a lot harder than it is with the with the copper. That's why I've been doing it traditionally. Okay, so I'm gonna do it one here. One, two. Ah, look at that beautiful work, guys and girls. So if I took this arrowhead that I just, let's say I just made it an hour ago and I had one that's 5,000 years old and I went to an archaeologist and I said, hey, which one's the oldest one? He couldn't tell because the process done all the way around the world had to be done with bone, wood, or some kind of uh, uh, soft, uh, probably antler from animals or bones. It leaves the same, almost the same mark or percussion flake here. So that's why they can't tell. And plus you can't carbon date rock unless you have some organic matter on it. Or, or it's found within the fireplace under the ground uh, or a hearth. Anyways, uh, yeah, so that's the process there. So that's really cool. I wish you guys were here because it's a lot different to, uh, to see it in person. But uh, So the first thing we know that you got to do for flint napping uh, here in Georgian Bay, here on this island, we know that stone tool manufacturing was going on over 5,000 years ago in Georgian Bay. Um, we know they had to travel up to 100 kilometers to maybe 200 kilometers to get chert, uh, which is a sedimentary stone. They brought it back to, to the island. 
uh, in what we call nodules. Uh, they come, they come back. They had their their their, their skins. They smash open a piece, and if they got a they got a nice big blank off, you know, that's a good, great start. You know, even getting to the right thinness. And then you get around to taking your piece, and you, you're going to shape it like I showed you a little bit earlier. You know, put it on your thigh or or do it by hand. That sort of thing. Then once you got your blank. You rough shape and how it's good. You got your right thickness. Then the fun part comes because you're going to, like I showed you with my thumb guard, uh, pressure flake it all the way around and it becomes really sharp. But my last stage I got to do, which I'm going to show you, is I want to make a corner notch. This is the notch that's going to be hafted into the wood. So after my sinew is wrapped around and it's gone through these corner notches, this is what gives the arrowhead its distinctive uh, look or uh, traits to a certain tribe or or those because everybody had their own style of how they did it. So let's take, a, I'm going to do a copper one. So this is where I'm going to make the corner notches. And what I mean by that, I'm going to, I'm just going to dig right in. I'm going to dig right into this little edge here. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, this could be dirty work too. Uh, you shouldn't be just doing this in the kitchen. I got glass now and shirt all over the place. Jennifer's gonna be all mad. Are you listening out there? <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna just go in one spot here. I'm gonna do a few more. And again, this is what will give it the distinctive look as an arrowhead. Ta-da! Got a little to, a little brewer to notch kind of a deal going there. I dig in there a little bit more. Of course, to make it, uh, I want a good secure point when I have to to my wood. So there you go. All right, so those are the three stages. We also showed you guys some tools. Uh, the antler tins work really, really good. Uh, modern day nappers, of course, use copper. And the last thing I want to share with you guys is it's really important. Uh, this is glue, and it's nature's glue. So as I said, I make my own stuff. So this is uh, pine pitch. So this is uh, the hard, hard stuff that you see on the pine trees. Um, you know, the reds, the oaks, the, the not the oaks, but the um, jack pines, that sort of thing. Because after I took my uh, my sinew, I want to weather. I want to weather it because if I left just the sinew there or the animal gut here, the sun and the rain would fray it, and then it won't be good. By taking this pine pitch, though. I heat it up and I'll put it all over here. And what it does is the pine pitch actually hardens like fiberglass and it's waterproof. So it'll keep my, my, my string attached and it won't fray, which is kind of cool. How we make this stuff. It's a great project. It's a lot of fun. Um, so I, like I said, I, I go to the pine tree, I find that hard stuff and I'll pick a whole bunch of it. And what I'll do is I'll clean the pine needles out of it. And I'll, I got a little tin can. And I'll melt it on the stove, and it just melts just like uh, like wax. It's really, really cool. Then I'll take hardwood charcoal, usually oak or hornbeam or um, ironwood. Uh, if you can get some hardwood charcoal, pound it up, mortar pestle to a nice powder. And do about, I do 50-40, so 50% sap and then 40% chalk or the uh, ashes, charcoal. And I mix it in there, and as it cools, uh, I get a pitch on a stick. Um... Yeah, a second. Let me show you something. Sorry, guys. You know, I have all kinds of lighters all the way around. Okay, so this is, I'm going to burn it here. Our ancestors would burn these at night, too, for torches so we can see. So once you get the pine sap on, it really goes in. Oh, such a beautiful smell. I wish we can get this as uh, underarm deodorant, you know, as we go camping for men and girls, you know, because it smells so good. Uh, some of the more traditional sap that was used as well comes out of birch bark. Uh, I have some birch bark there. And if you ever burn birch bark, you see the white smoke coming of it. That's the resin inside the birch bark. But our ancestors would use a goose egg or a turkey egg and they'd rip up the birch bark, cut a little hole in the egg. They wouldn't waste the contents. They pack the egg with a bunch of the birch bark, 
and they would cover the little hole with mud. They would dig a hole in the ground and put a fire on top of it. It takes like 15 to 25 hours. But after that time period, at the bottom of that egg, that resin leaks out of the birch bark and it's black. It's really cool. And then uh, you mix it with uh, rabbit poo, shells from the beach, you more impress them, cook them in the fire. Uh, the poo is like a, it helps it stick together in the shell as well, but it gives it elasticity as well. So that kind of glue onto the birch bark is a little bit more high quality than, than the pine pitch. Even when our ancestors were canoeing, they would always go to a stand by, by the end of the day or the end of the night because if they had holes in their canoes, the resource for the material was right there, right? Or they carried it as well as they were going on. But nonetheless, everything you see here comes from nature, everything. And that's how it was. All right. So if not any questions, um, oh, the last thing is that we showed you that tool called the Adelano or Apogonotig in our language. And uh, yeah. So there you have it. I'll take some questions if you have any questions. Cool. So yeah, for those of us in the meeting, if you have any have any questions, I have you all muted and your cameras are off, but I believe you should be able to raise your hand. There should be like in the toolbar or the top of your screen or the side of the screen or the bottom, depending what kind of device you're using. You should see uh, a few icons and there is a picture of a hand. So if you want to hit that button, if you have a question or you can use the chat and type it out and I can uh, pass it along to Sean. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was really cool. I guess I had a couple of questions, so I guess um. I guess first of all, the biggest one is because it's hard for us to tell because we're not there in person or you can be here with us in person. But uh, like, what does it feel like when you're doing that? Like what? Like how much pressure are you feeling like as you're holding it, as you're striking it, like all that? Like, what does that feel like to you? Or if we were going to do it, what would that feel like to us when you're doing that? Yeah, to me, it's just it, the thing about spalling off these big pieces that I think that's the, the most difficult part, I think, because you want to, once you get really good at the craft or the art, you'll be able to get the hit at the right place where you, where it won't be big, thick pieces coming off. Mm. You want th the main thing is to get that thinness, right? That, uh, that five millimeters at least. Uh, but what it feels like is uh, when I'm pushing really hard on my, on my thigh with it and I have that ridge, especially if you have a good defined ridge, you can feel it. And it, you'll know when you, when you hit it, it gives you a little bit of shock because it, that's what it is, a shock wave that comes through the stone. I remember what I mentioned earlier about um, producing the, the waves uh, and cre creating a, what we call a Hertzian cone. That's the percussion going into the stone and it freezes there after a while because it, like I said, it happens so fast. But yeah, but once you hit it, it, it and you did a good job, the sound of it actually will tell you you did a good job. Even when I'm pressure flaking or I'm doing by hand, there's a certain sound that you, oh yeah, you know, you're doing it right. Because there's other sounds that when I first started, you're smashing little pieces, they're coming off, they're not coming off in flakes. But the sound of it's really cool too. But it's a lot of fun uh, getting used to smashing and using that 90 degree, uh, under 90 degree thing. Yeah, it's a lot of fun though. That's really cool. Any other questions? I don't know, it's quiet over there. Okay, last uh, last thing then I'll share with you is that um, with everybody is that uh, I was in a movie. Um, the movie came out not this spring, but last spring. Uh, it's called The Silencing, and you can only see it on Prime. It's a great movie, actually. Um, it was all shot in Sudbury. I was the Adelaide Indigenous consultant for the movie. Um, so I had to go down to Sudbury. Um, so I showed them. I showed them all the Adelaide. I taught them everything. I even showed them how to throw it. Uh, the, the guy from Game of Thrones is on, he's the main actor in the movie, Jesse, um, oh, I forget his name, cool guy. You'll see a couple of folks in there from, from other shows. So it's called The Saddest Thing, only on Prime, and uh, it's a whodunit, kind of a scary kind of a flick. And uh, the person going around killing people is actually using the Adelato. So I flip -napped the Obsidian Arrowhead for the movie. I carved, hand carved the Adelato itself for the movie out of cedar. And then uh, in the shafts, and my name's actually way down in the credits. So if you're looking for my name at the at, in the, the main credits, unfortunately, you got to wait right till the end almost. I had to wait for a while. I was thinking, well, maybe they forgot to put my name in there. <laughs> I saw it. In there. 
But I saw it way down in the, in the, on the end down there. So, okay, well, that's better than nothing. So yeah. it's called Wasada Singh. You can see it on Prime. Oh, that's so cool. Thanks so much, Sean. This was, uh, like, this is really cool for me to to learn all this stuff. Like, it, uh, it's really amazing. Thanks for taking the time to do that. It's a really cool opportunity. Well, absolutely. And, and you guys got artifacts that you guys have over there that, you know, yeah. it was done the same way. Like, you know? Yeah. Exactly the same way. So, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. you want me to come back at some point in real life? Um, real life. As in person? Uh, <laughs> just give me a heads up and... Uh, I'd be more than welcome to when I come down. <laughs> oh man, I'd, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah, thanks so much. So yeah, thanks, thanks uh, for doing this, Sean. I really appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. That was really cool for me, and I'm sure everybody else appreciated it too. Christy says that was great. Okay, Thank perfect. You. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, at the end of this week, Friday, we'll have Hunter Corbier coming to share some of her knowledge with us as well. Um, she's uh, got a lot to share about all sorts of different um crafting techniques and things like uh, that so it's really cool yeah i'm looking forward to that so yeah thanks thanks a lot sean enjoy the rest of your day you're welcome. all right yeah. you guys too okay take stay care. safe okay bye bye